I had a couple thoughts. Um, the first thing, one of the things that occurred to me when talking about this whole commission idea, narrowing the um, range of thoughts and, you know, the rest of it is, is a, a joke about um, bipartisanship. But John O'Sullivan tells this joke where some foreign visitors come to visit a congressional office and the uh, staff member kind of gives them a little orientation about American politics. And what he says is, look, we have two parties in America. One is the evil party and one is the stupid party. Uh, and then sometimes congressmen get together and do something that's both stupid and evil, <laughs> and it's called bipartisanship. Um, you know, when they talk about these commissions having, you know, a range of you, Republicans and Democrats and independents on them, and it's true, they do. Spence Abraham was the Republican uh, co-chairman of one of the commissions that uh, Stanley wrote about. Jeb Bush was the uh, Republican co-chairman of uh, one of the other ones. But what they have is they have Republicans, Democrats, and independents who all think the same way on immigration. Um, uh, what, this whole idea of kind of depoliticizing the issue, what it really reminded me of, uh, or I thought of it when I, start, when I read about this no labels movement that they were, not movement, but uh, they had a press conference this week, there's some effort um, to promote this group called No Labels. You know, let's not have labels, let's just do what's right for the American people and move forward, blah, blah, blah. Well, what it was was uh, Democrats and liberal Republicans getting together and saying you shouldn't label us for the particular policy preferences that we have, and if you disagree, then there's something wrong with you. I mean, it's, a, it's very similar, actually, to this whole um, dynamic that involved, that, that, that these kind of task forces on immigration in particular um, uh, exemplify. And Stanley actually, when he said the goal of them is to, or, or what they do, or what they potentially would do if the recommendations were followed, would be to remove the voice of the American people from immigration policy. But that's the point, in a sense. Um, and it's the point precisely because there is an enormous elite public gap on immigration. In other words, I think what we see with these Blue Ribbon Commissions is a manifestation of that huge gap. The Chicago Council on Foreign Relations has actually done survey research on this, and they found that on immigration, and they asked questions sort of different aspects of the immigration issue in different ways, so it wasn't just one question, but what they found is that the gap between elite views and opinion leader views, uh, public, uh, you know, elite views, basically the kinds of people who would be on these kind of task forces. The gap between elite and public views was bigger on immigration than on any other issue they polled on. Even things like support for foreign aid or support for the UN, where you would expect there would be a big gap between public views and elite views, and there was a big gap. Immigration, there was an even bigger gap. So what, these, what the dynamic that these task forces represent, I think, really is the elite talking to itself. And one and the reason they don't address some of these questions that Stanley highlighted and Hans referred to is because, um, you know, they're just, uh, when members of the elite talk to each other about immigration, those things just don't come up. Uh, I mean, in some cases, I think it really is an intentional decision not to address them. Um, but I'm actually willing to give some of these people at least the benefit of the doubt that it's literally just not something that's on their radar. I mean, they've just, they have no conception that the astonishing lack of diversity in the immigration flow is a problem or that it even exists. I mean, it's just not, uh, I mean, I think for some of these people, they just don't get it. They don't even know that it's there. Uh, that's why I think Bill Buckley's comment um, from years ago applies to the immigration policy, is that I'd rather immigration policy be made by the first 2,000 names in the Boston phone directory than by the, uh, either the faculty of Harvard, which is what he was talking about, or all the members of these blue ribbon um, commissions. But see, that's my point about <coughs> removing the voice of the American people from immigration policy clearly is a, uh, uh, would be a problematic result from these recommendations, but I think they those members of these task forces who are sort of self-aware enough to understand that their fish, you know, that they're not, I mean, the fish swimming in the water doesn't always wet. Well, those that do know they're wet, if you will, to use that analogy, uh -huh. they want to take the voice of the American people out of immigration policy because they really don't like or trust the American people all that much, mm -hmm. uh, especially on this issue, maybe mm -hmm. on all issues. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point is to prevent the public from having a voice 
in immigration policy because the public is atavistic and backward and benighted and all the rest of it, and so they shouldn't be able to have that kind of voice. I think that's clearly part of the point. And the only other thing I wanted to touch on is a different uh, aspect of this. Stanley, you talked about the asymmetry mm -hmm. of the deal. In other words, that the amnesty supporters got their amnesty right up front, mm -hmm. and people concerned about enforcement you know, got promises of it in the future. Um, you know, the check is in the mail. Mm -hmm. um, that's very true. But adding to that asymmetry, one of the things that actually sort of uh, makes that even more asymmetrical is that it's not just that the enforcement mechanisms we have in place, like E-Verify, still, you know, require um, more road testing and improvement and all the rest of it. It's not even just that we don't have, in other areas, the full capacity. In other words, maybe enough enforcement agents, enough ICE agents, all of that kind of capacity issues, which are very important. But it's also that every single enforcement measure, every single one without exception, will be litigated in the courts. The ACLU will, I mean, the ACLU and its, and I use it sort of a shorthand, but mm -hmm. MALDEF and mm -hmm. PEARLDEF and all of its related mm -hmm. groups, their reason for existence at this point mm -hmm. is to prevent enforcement of immigration mm -hmm. laws. I mean, it's not too much to say that for MALDEF and PEARLDEF, but mm -hmm. I think even for the ACLU, mm -hmm. because, you know, there's nobody, there's no real restrictions on political speech, you know, mm -hmm. so and there's, you know, the, I guess there's not a lot of Nazis marching through neighborhoods mm -hmm. of Holocaust survivors for them to defend. And so now what they're doing is they're focusing on mm -hmm. preventing immigration wars. That is their goal. So, I mean, I would just point out that part of the asymmetry, I think, is actually intentional. In other words, let's get the amnesty now, mm -hmm. and we'll rely on the ACLU mm -hmm. to make sure that the other side of the deal will never happen anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they hope it won't happen, or that it'll be stretched out into the future, it's that they know perfectly well mm -hmm. and are in fact involved in helping fund efforts to make sure that the bait and switch mm -hmm. works out the way um, they would want it to work out. Mm -hmm. um, and the only other thing I'd add, this sort of relates to the first point about the narrowing options. I actually um, know one of the people who was originally on, I don't want to name names, but was on one of these panels or was invited to be on and went initially. And he was kind of a skunk at the garden party and ended up not being on the commission anymore. I mean, uh -huh. it, was, it wasn't just even just pre-selection, although that was part of it, mm -hmm. but even efforts at broadening mm -hmm. the variety of people who would be on one of these task forces resulted in a result they didn't like, mm -hmm. somebody who was too in favor of enforcement. And so he was kind of ostracized, eased mm -hmm. out, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sort of erased, uh, sent down the memory hole. And so, I mean, it's, in other words, it's not even just an accidental result. It's not even a result of planning ahead of time. Mm -hmm. But when they're faced with mm -hmm. someone offering them options that they don't want to address, mm -hmm. then they sort of got rid of the person. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, it really is striking how narrow and how sort of almost blinders these mm -hmm. kind of uh, task, these specific task forces have had, as opposed to things like, you know, the debt reduction or the deficit task mm -hmm. force mm -hmm. that Simpson and, and mm -hmm. I forget who the other one was, where they seem to actually have embraced a pretty broad, whether they endorsed it or not, whether I endorsed it or not, isn't even mm -hmm. the point. The point is they actually looked at a whole variety of First options. Goals. That's right the Democrat co-chairman. They looked at a lot of options, mm -hmm. pretty much the full range mm -hmm. of kind of realistic options, mm -hmm. short of, you know, selling the Washington Monument or something. Mm -hmm. In other words, they looked at real, the real panoply of options. On immigration, you know, a whole group of the options are simply, you know, they're, they're considered absurd. They're like, um, you know, Jonathan Swift talking about eating Irish babies. Well, obviously it's not serious, and so obviously any consideration of an immigration reduction that's as absurd to them mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. as Swift's recommendations, and so it's not even something that is on their radar uh, in a way that's just not true with other commissions. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. anyway, um, that's all.